Welcome to this conversation with Peter Jennings, who's just announced his retirement after 10 years as CEO of ASPI, the Australian Strategic Policy Initiative, which was actually set up by the Howard government when I was Deputy Prime Minister in around 2000. He's done an outstanding job in an outstanding organisation and will remain involved. Uh, his intellectual input will be greatly valued in the future as it has been in the past, even though he'll be a little less uh, hands-on. Uh, and I should, by way of declaration, say that the government has kindly asked me to join as a director of ASPE in the future, just in terms of declaring my own position on this. But I wanted to talk to Peter about the uh, serious deterioration in the global outlook since we last spoke just a couple of years ago. Great urgency. We now have the hideous contemplation of the most serious war in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Many would say we should have seen it coming. We've just had President Zelensky, who really has inspired the world with um, his bravery and his leadership of his country. Indeed, if, if nothing else, Australia should have taken this lesson when you demonstrate that you believe in yourself and you do your utmost to defend your freedoms, you buy time and respect so that others will join you. Uh, and I hope Australians are absorbing that message. Uh, but Peter, thank you so much again for your time uh, and the time you've given Aspie for that matter. Uh, your input's very valuable. Uh, can we start with President Zelensky? He warned us yesterday that we need to recognise that conflict uh, does not recognise boundaries. Uh, you could almost channel those chilling words of Trotsky uh, from uh, around 100 years ago, that you may not be looking for war, but war is looking for you. Uh, yes, John, and uh, and uh, thanks for uh, once again having me on, on your program. Um, I, I think that we are indeed um, uh, facing a serious risk of uh, conflict around the world, much more widely spread than simply inside the borders of Ukraine. And indeed, inside the Australian uh, national security community, there's a, an evolving view that uh, mid-decade, mid-2020s, is a time when we should be particularly concerned, especially in the Asia-Pacific part of the world, about the risks to Taiwan presented by an, an aggressive and assertive People's Republic of China. Um, uh, having learnt perhaps the wrong lessons from the, the Ukraine uh, conflict, John. Um, and uh, I think if you look at the European situation, even now the, the, the risks of uh, that war uh, sort of leaking over the borders of Ukraine into uh, uh, NATO Europe um, uh, remain, I, I think, particularly high. We've seen a pause in Russian military operations at the moment, um, apart from some activity still down in the south of Ukraine, but that doesn't mean to say that it's over. Uh, and uh, nor do I necessarily believe the um, advice from the Russian high command, which purports to say that they're only going to concentrate on the eastern provinces, uh, uh, the, the two um, so-called rebel provinces, which Russia has controlled since 2014. So in Europe, um, we see the risks of uh, conflict potentially spreading. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, we see um, a, a China perhaps taking a leaf out of Putin's playbook to uh, create similar problems amongst a number of its neighbours. The truth is these are dangerous times and um, we've gotten out of the habit in Australia of thinking about that. Uh, you know, we tend to think about defence equipment purchases over 20-year time frames. We really should be worried, in my view, about the world that we might be looking at in 2023, 2024. Um, and if any of that even sounds remotely plausible, uh, I think governments would be doing things quite differently to what they're doing at the moment. And that's, in one sense, what is really worrying me. I'm one of uh, the 10% the of Australians, according to the surveys, who think the issue in this election should be who can best secure Australia's place in a very dangerous world. Uh, and uh, I... I'm one of those people who's fortunate enough never to have fought. I was too young for Vietnam. Uh, but I lived in the shadow of war because my father was in the famous 9th Division that Rommel so revered, uh, where he was almost killed, wasn't expected to live. And he would wake up sometimes reliving the moment when the shells started going off uh, and he was horrendously wounded. As I say, his friends were told he wouldn't see the night out. He did and limped back to Australia. But 
And, and people treated him differently because they knew he'd been there. He'd seen it. He paid a terrible price, not quite death, but very close to it. So there was that sort of deep awareness, which has driven me to a deep desire. I've been fortunate enough to avoid it. Even if it happened now, I will still have lived most of my life. But I have children and I have grandchildren. And I am really concerned about what you've just alluded to, that lack of urgency. It does seem to me that credit where credit is due, our Prime Minister has done a superb job for a country of 25 million as its leader to shape up the international debate and that term, we are facing an arc of autocracy, seems to be powerful and we ought to take note and perhaps he's getting more credit for it internationally than he is here. Yes, I think uh, a number of factors came together in terms of Scott Morrison's thinking about the international environment. And uh, I sort of put the defining moment for him at, at about mid-2020, which was when uh, a strategic update was released by Defence. And the, the effect of that update was really to, uh, for the first time publicly, um, start to uh, uh, talk about the, the, the near-term risks that we faced in the region. Um, let, let's be direct about it as a result of the rise of um, an authoritarian and more aggressive China. And I think having gone through the process of, of sort of shepherding that document to publication, Scott Morrison had been persuaded by defence and the intelligence community that we faced a a near-term risk. Uh, when he launched the the, uh, the document, John, he, he sort of said, I've been thinking a lot about the 1930s and the slide to, to war in that era, and it's playing very heavily on my mind. Not, not a scripted comment in a speech, but something that was obviously just reflected his, his real emotions about it. And then from that time, I, I think a number of things emerged. One was that Morrison was prepared more often and more directly to mention China by name uh, instead of what had become something of an Australian practice to kind of tiptoe around the phrase, don't mention the war, uh, as one might put it. Um, as all of a sudden, Morrison started to, to get more direct. And then the second thing that happened was COVID. And, uh, you know, one of the few positive linings, silver linings that I can find from COVID is that it forced Morrison into a phase of Zoom diplomacy, where all of a sudden it was possible for him to talk directly with the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of the UK, and a whole range of other democracies besides, that Morrison would not, under any circumstances, have been able in normal times to travel to and spend that amount of time out of the country. And I think that what we saw over uh, 2021 was was a sort of a arrival of a loose coalition of democratic leaders around the world talking with each other, uh, sh sharing similar concerns about the, the autocracies and the, th the threats that they presented in different ways in, in their own regions. And so all of a sudden we now have some coalition forming. We get AUKUS, we get a revised quad bringing together the US, Japan, India and Australia. Um, uh, we see NATO starting to take seriously its spending commitments on defence. Um, and, and so over the course of 2021, there's, there's a bit of a, a democratic pushback. Uh, and you might say, John, not a moment too soon, but at, at least it happened. Uh, and, and I think now the, the challenge is to solidify that um, and, and to, for, for democratic governments to keep explaining to their populations what the problem is. In, in clear and simple language. Um, uh, so I'm not naturally a, an optimist. Uh, you know, most, most strategists are pessimists and I'm a pessimist, but I have to tell you, I think we, we, we've come into 2022 in a, in a somewhat better position than we were after years of drifting, uh, really allowing ourselves to become way too dependent on China. That, that has now, I think, come to, to a halt. Uh, well, let's come to um, the... the urgency or lack thereof or need for more in Australia in a moment. But before we do, as you say, late in the piece, but thus far, Western unity must have very much surprised the Russians and the Chinese must be watching closely. It has been quite extraordinary. And I think the thing that um, you just touched on it, we've got to stay the course. Um, Neil Ferguson commented in one of these conversations a few days ago that the greatest danger would be that people would go back to sleep. Yeah. Um, President Zelensky 
single-handedly. We owe him a lot. He's not letting us go back to sleep. By sheer courage, we have to stand. Nobody could with any sense shred of decency not stand with he and his people in the current circumstances, and it's gone on longer than the Russians expected, probably than we expected. But can that unity hold? Will Germany, which has been, I'm going to say it, I can say it, I've got nothing to lose. It's because I think it's become a very soft society, you know, and a very switched on to their own material well-being society. All of a sudden, a left of centre leader and a green foreign minister declare that their defence so a, a capability is simply inadequate. They need to double defence expenditure. Not only that, Germany will wear the pain of massive interruptions to the supply of and the cost of energy. And in many ways, you could also say that President Biden, fumbles notwithstanding so far, has helped coordinate a global response. How effective do you think that's been? What impact do you think it's happening in Russia what are your views on whether it can be maintained? Well, uh, let, let's start by by looking at what uh, I think is the, both the Russian and the Chinese perspective on this issue. Uh, and that is to say, um, uh, I think Putin and Xi Jinping both have bought the view that the West is in terminal decline and that it, all they have to do is sort of, sort of push against this edifice of, of uh, cr- crumbling Western democracy and the authoritarian regimes will ultimately win out. I, I think that Putin um, significantly underestimated the extent to which um, it, uh, the invasion uh, of Ukraine was going to be resisted, both by the Ukrainians. I think he would have been astonished, frankly, as most of us were, by the change of um, attitude on the part of the Germans, a very welcome change of attitude to um, step forward to something of a security leadership position, which is what Germany has needed to do really since the, the fall of the wall. Um, and I think um, in the case of China, um, you know, it's it's always a mistake to underestimate the Americans. Uh, and, and I think that is what Xi Jinping is doing at the moment. There are dangers in that, of course, because it, it leads to um, overconfidence, um, of which uh, one can see a great deal of that in the Chinese system right now and, and uh, in the Chinese military. So... Um, can the democracies hold together? Well, um, so far they have. Uh, it's not pretty. Uh, it's not aligned. But then if you go back to read the history of the Second World War, it wasn't either then. I mean, there, there was huge fights between London and Washington, no. uh, between uh, Churchill and, uh, and FDR, vast differences of opinion about how the war should be prosecuted. Um, and and so why, I don't think we should expect anything anything different now. But um, I, I think we've seen a tremendous shot in the arm to uh, European unity. Um, uh, Putin has really achieved the opposite of every strategic objective he said was important to him when he attacked Ukraine. He now has un- NATO more unified. He now has um, a number of countries like Finland and Sweden desperately wanting to get into NATO, or, or at least in the Finns case, starting to talk seriously about it. Um, uh, you know, um, the the, uh, the Ukrainians did not, uh, as it turned out, welcome uh, Russian occupiers with 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 open arms. So every strategic objective that Putin set for himself has now failed, as a result of Europe's own approach to dealing with these security issues. In our part of the world, uh, something I think we can take um, a lot of uh, strength in is the growing closeness of a defence relationship between Australia and Japan. Uh, which really, uh, in the addition of the United, with the addition of the United States, is the critical strategic uh, sort of bulwark of security uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So I I think that once placed under pressure, uh, the democracies start to perform better, um, and clearly that's what uh, China and Russia. And uh, maybe let's throw in North Korea as well. That that is what they're doing. They're placing the democracies under pressure, and they're forcing uh, various political leaders around the world to all of a sudden take that seriously. After s- several decades where we were failing to do that, and at least in Australia's case, just riding on the coattails of American security, uh, you know, really fooling ourselves that two percent of gross domestic product being spent on defence was all Australia would ever need to do to, to look after our, our security interests. I think I think we're past that point. 
uh, things could snap back. I suppose there is always potentially a risk of that, particularly if China, for example, gives up on its aggressive rhetoric and starts to go back to the so-called era of peaceful rise. But I think we've gone too far for that, really. I think things are locked in now as long as Xi Jinping is leader and as long as Vladimir Putin is leader of Russia. Um, and so, yeah, maybe we can be a little bit more positive about the ability of the democracies to hang together. Um, just don't expect it to be clean or pretty. Uh, John would be uh, my way of describing it. It's a really important point. And you just touched on something I'd like to explore now. Um, you said never underestimate, underestimate the Americans. And you've been writing about Australia not preparing for the Second World War. A little bit of history that you'd be aware of. Hit, uh, Churchill always felt that Germany had been encouraged to believe that the West wouldn't stand up for itself and that later it's certainly the case the Japanese didn't think the Americans had it in them, particularly to fight a submarine warfare, which people underestimate. You know, they starved Japan of oil uh, and, and energy. But you go back to February 1933, following a similar debate in Cambridge, which didn't get a lot of publicity, although I dare say it was noticed in Europe, there was a famous debate by the Oxford Union where... Um, this House decided by a margin of something like nearly 300 to about 150, as I recall, that under no circumstances would it fight for king and country. And that was seen as, oh, the Brits, young Brits, they've lost belief in their own culture, their own values, et cetera, et cetera. You yourself have been writing uh, very powerfully and effectively that we should not be like we were in the 30s when despite the gathering evidence that there was real trouble coming, and in contrast to the way a younger nation had responded to the rise of dangers prior to the First World War, people mm. forget that, we secured our homeland, and only then did we send Anzacs off, because we had a modern navy. It took five years from ordering to being delivered, but different to the timetable for the submarines we're looking at today. Um, this, so it brings you to this attitude, this question of attitude, you know, snapping out of it, being prepared to recognise that we're not just the sons and daughters of an evil colonial regime, but actually our values on balance are worth fighting for, as Zelensky and his people have done. Um, do you think, um, to put it bluntly, we might see a retreat of naive wokeism sufficient for people to recognise, for example, that we cannot compromise our energy uh, dependence at this point? In time. Well, you know, just reflecting on your comments, John, I, I think to myself, how would a debate like that run uh, if it was being held in an Australian university uh, today? I, I, I would almost guarantee you that you'd probably get a similar result um, about the um, uh, impossibility of conflict. And, and um, uh, maybe that says something about how universities function, you know, with regard to our broader, our broader societies. Um, but you ask, frankly, a, a, a fundamental question. Um, let's let's look at the Ukraine situation. I mean, I, I would have said almost universally, uh, and not just in Russia, but almost universally, the view was Ukrainians were not going to fight for for their uh, for their territory, and that we were going to see. Um, uh, sort of a, a race to the capital, a, a, an installation of a puppet leader, and Ukrainians would simply accept that that was their their new new future. Um, I, I've been spending a bit of time talking to Taiwanese friends, and uh, since the Russian invasion, to sort of ask the question: Well, how do, how do you think the Taiwanese population would react if uh, if China uh, were to attack? And at least there, there is. Um, a strong view expressed, um, particularly amongst uh, the younger generations in Taiwan, which is demographically the largest part of the population, that yes, they would be prepared to fight, and that having seen the experience of democracy being squashed in Hong Kong, uh, the Taiwanese are ready to defend what, what they value. Um, I think in Australia we would only really ever know the answer to the question about what our own population would do should we find ourselves come under... Um, sufficient um, pressure. But, uh, you know, maybe there's a positive to take from the, I think, instinctive way that the vast majority of Australians find themselves being sympathetic to Ukraine and to Vladimir Zelensky. Um, 
So I, I think I think the, the 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 question can only be answered when when the pressure comes on, and it's not as direct uh, uh, in Australia as it is perhaps in uh, Japan uh, or, or in or in Taiwan. But we should be confident enough in our own people, John. And um, really, maybe the the harder question is: w- What would our vice chancellors do? Um, what would our state state premiers do? Uh, what would our top business leaders do? Particularly those uh, making money from selling commodities to China. I mean, th- there is, I think, now almost a sense of um, elites in Australia struggling with the reality of having built too much dependence on China and not being happy with the alternative, which is how do we make ourselves stronger by diversifying our international relationship. But I think your average Australian understands that problem and, and you know, is probably ahead of where uh, a number of those elites are in terms of thinking about where our fundamental interests lie. Not for the first time. Now, it's worth remembering that, in fact, of course, those very uh, Oxford students who said that they wouldn't fight under any circumstances, only a matter of a few short years ago and later, they were. And it's worth remembering that those soft Americans and in inverted commas who were not supposed to be able to mount a submarine warfare, well, they did highly successfully. And I think that plays into your point. Yes, yes. And, and John, just on that point too, those, those Oxford students, their parents had fought in the First World War and it, it, it would hardly be unreasonable to think, well, that was a really awful thing and Europe should never never face it again. So no one should be wanting uh, conflict. And, and really, the, the, the thing is, we have to work out how we can av- avoid this under all circumstances. But of course, the key is to make ourselves strong enough and to make the region strong enough that those who might attack us just m- come to the decision that that's not a smart thing to do. No, I, I think that's, and I, these things are important because I'll, I'll come to our, our national sense of urgency in a minute. But Compass Polling did some interesting work at, at my request a few days ago, and you may have seen it written up. Uh, it got lost a bit in the budget, but it did certainly create a reaction amongst those who saw it. Uh, 65% of Australians agreed with the proposition that we ought to do more with cadet corps, training our young people. And I wanted to know whether people would see the, the importance of that as you watch Ukrainians uh, who obviously trained themselves up well, and even those who hadn't. I think uh, the Prime Minister's wife was photographed with a machine gun saying, I didn't think I'd ever have to pick one of these up. And I thought it'd be a good thing if we had more people infused in, in throughout our society, as we once did, who were familiar with military principles, leadership, discipline, drill, how to use let's face it, weapons, how to cope with emergencies. 65% of Australians strongly agreed. There was a political breakup, which was very interesting. I mean, it's, you know, I just put this down. It was quite a large poll. Um, uh, It was extremely popular with coalition voters, surprisingly popular with Labor voters, unpopular with Green voters, whose leader, of course, says the best defence policy, the gold standard is New Zealand's. We should cut it in half. And effectively, we need a peacekeeping force. On the other hand, 53% of Australians said if confronted with the Ukrainian situation, they might leave the country. So we ha- we're at a stage where I think we're still thinking this through and we'll come to what I think is, well, it's the driving force for me wanting to talk to you today, the Solomons. I don't know in the context of this election that we yet have the urgency that we need, yet 65% of people are saying, yeah, we should do more of that to train up our young people. That's a lot of people. It's nearly two thirds. Yes, yes, it is, and and uh, you know, it, it's important also to remember that that uh, our, our defence force now is, in terms of full time service, about about sixty five thousand people, and that's often been said. You know, about half a decent MCG crowd. It's it's a tiny organisation, and the the truth of the matter, John, is that. Um, Australians that have any contact with uh, serving members of the Australian Defence Force or the wider mm-hmm. defence organisation are a tiny number compared to the overall size of our population. So um, defence is now something which has become a, a kind of a niche profession pursued by a small number of people and quite removed from the broader experience of the larger mm-hmm. Australian population. And I that that's probably not a good thing. I, I think it's almost certainly not a good thing when you you have a situation that a country is facing, you know, a very risky decade um, of uh, of uh, international security problems. Um, 
Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the more we can get um, the Australian population acquainted with the Defence Force and understanding what military service is about, it, it, the better uh, from the point of view of um, everyone uh, in our population. Um, you know, on, on Ukraine, uh, it, it's, it's, I think, perhaps forgotten that Ukraine has been fighting a tough war against Russia now since 2014 when the Russians invaded uh, Crimea and the Donbass region, the two so-called renegade provinces, and, and there have been, you know, thousands of Ukrainian casualties. Um, the, the result of that is that you have a battle-hardened military force in Ukraine, uh, and you have a Ukrainian population which has been, you know, watching this story unfold for um, um, seven or eight years, um, and just sort of habituated to understand that their country is under threat and that they need to be able to do things to, to protect it. Um, in Australia's case, that's not been our military experience of the last 20 years. You know, all, all my time in the Defence Department, uh, we were fighting uh, wars overseas. We were in the Middle East almost continuously for two decades. We were pursuing stabilisation operations in Timor and uh, Solomon Islands and Bougainville and places like that. But war was something that we could choose to do and it was far away from, from our shores. Um, and it was containable. It was something that small numbers of Australians could could deal with. Um, what uh, is the, the the risk we face now is something that could be much bigger than that on a sort of Russia and Ukraine scale um, uh, that could potentially even touch our shores, given uh, China's um, investment in long range missile systems. That that's a different type of strategic threat. And I, I don't think Australians have thought that hard about it. Um, uh, I think it is pretty remote from the consciousness of, of our of average people. Um, and, um, uh, you, you know, that's, that's just the reality we face. This is why I think it's so important for governments to have honest conversations with the Australian people about the challenges that, that we face. Well, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And that's precisely what uh, my motivation in, in talking to you today is. Uh, and I was just on that very point. I was talking to an Australian whose mind and intellect and, and, and his sort of contact with an understanding of the Australian people I really respect the other day. And he said, you know, it's been hard to really engage personally when you look at the Ukraine, even though we're very concerned about it. But my goodness, what's happening in the Solomons? That was a real wake up call for that individual. Now, you've been writing quite powerfully about this. Um, a, a funny little story that was perhaps quite telling. I represented John Howard at the Pacific Island Forum meeting in Palau in 1999, and I had a sidelines meeting with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of the Solomon Islands who asked me when Australia, when my the government that I was part of and when Australia was going to accept that it had a moral responsibility to launch a military operation in his <laughs> country. I felt like writing a book ever since. The time, the day I was asked to invade another country by the Prime Minister of that country. Uh, and of course, under the UN arrangements uh, auspices, we had Ramsey and ended up being directly involved. It doesn't seem to have won us quite the respect we might have liked. This development in the Solomons is, I think, truly concerning. You've been writing about it. What do you think it means and how should it serve? to shape our thinking? Well, uh, we have known inside the national security community for um, a, a number of years that China has been looking to establish um, military facilities for itself in, in the Pacific region. And, and a number of approaches have been made to Pacific Island governments and sometimes to provincial level governments to try to start that um, um, uh, exercise to to build uh, a naval base or an air base. Wh why is China interested in doing this? Well, um, it's interested in doing it because it is learning how to operate its military forces at distances much further uh, afield from uh, its own home bases. Uh, and I think in the Pacific, what China is looking to do is to complicate the life of the United States. It, it wants to make it harder for the US to bring its own military forces closer to Western Asia. Uh, my, my view, John, is that what we're seeing unfold is a 2022 version 
of the strategy that was developed by the uh, Japanese Imperial Armed Forces in, in the Second World War. Uh, when Japan went to war, what it sought to do was to control Southeast Asia, uh, which it did uh, by land invasion, but also by controlling the air and sea in, in the South China Sea. Uh, and then as Japan pushed further south, what it was looking to do was to control uh, Papua New Guinea and, and the, um, the Solomon Islands, the islands of Melanesia, in order to make it that much harder for the United States to approach the Japanese homeland. Uh, and the second half of the Pacific War was a story about how America fought its way through those islands right up to the Japanese homeland. Um, geography doesn't change. China is seeking to do the same thing. It wants to dominate Southeast Asia by controlling the South China Sea. And arguably, you could say it's achieved that objective at a time when the West was looking in a different direction. And now it's looking to extend that control even further by building relationships with Melanesian countries, which will exclude Australia and other countries not friendly to China um, and make it hard for the United States to bring its aircraft carrier battle groups closer to the Chinese mainland. I, so I see this as very much a part of a long term strategy designed to secure military dominance for China in the Pacific region. Um, I, I guess it's obvious why that matters to Australia, because um, if a base in the Solomons was allowed to uh, establish itself, then for the first time since 1942, we would be facing a threat from the east of uh, our, uh, our country um, in a way that we have not been uh, thinking about or planning for for, for, several, for several generations. And um, I, I don't think it's accidental, John, by the way, that this, this sort of now sees the light of day just weeks after um, our own government has announced uh, an intent to build um, and home port nuclear powered submarines on Australia's east coast. So uh, if I was a planner in Beijing wanting to complicate Australia's military life, thinking about that uh, Australian submarine base that's going to be created in the course of a decade, I would be looking too to create a base uh, somewhere to the east of Australia where I could locate long-range maritime patrol aircraft, where I could build a stock of missile systems, where I could perhaps store sea mines that could then be deployed uh, by so-called Chinese fishing vessels. Um, you know, all, all of this could be said to be theoretical, but it's very much part of the Chinese playbook. And, and if you want an example of that, look at how from 2014 through to 2022, we went from no Chinese military presence in the South China Sea, just a bunch of rocks and shoals, as Obama's administration referred to it, to a point now that we have three large military air bases associated with ports in the South China Sea, with surface-to-air missiles located, with uh, radar systems located, with regular Chinese aircraft and ship movements through the region. All of, all of that achieved, you know, basically in eight years. Now, you give China the opportunity to do something in secret, which is what it was trying to do in the Solomons, unconstrained by having to tell, talk to the Solomons government about what they were doing. Who knows where that could take China uh, over the course of um, eight, eight years or a decade. But it, it is something that, you know, Australia um, sh should be deeply concerned about. This is, as far as I'm concerned, a red line for our security. And we, we have to find ways to try to prevent this from happening. Your colleague, Michael Shoebridge uh, at ASPE has written that the draft, leaked draft agreement, I'm very glad we have it, because this is the extraordinary thing about the Chinese. They can ball tastely say, when it suits them, we must obey international laws and norms, ignoring the fact that the South China Seas is illegal in every possible sense yes. of the word in terms of international norms and legal understanding, and has been found to be so. But I'll just quote this, China may, this is part of the draft agreement, may according to its own needs and with the consent of the Solomon Islands, make ship visits to, carry out logistical replenishment in, and have stopover and transition in the Solomon Islands, and the relevant forces of China can be used to protect the safety of Chinese personnel and major projects in the Solomon yeah. Islands. That doesn't sound like it's something that um, a sovereign nation, which the Prime Minister of the Solomon says 
uh, uh, the Solomons are is it doesn't sound like something they've had much input into or that it's balanced. It sounds very much like it's written for the benefit of the Chinese. That's that's right. It, it really is quite quite shocking. And, and uh, I'm surprised to see uh, even Prime Minister Sogavare prepared to quite barter uh, the, the sovereignty of his country for, for the sake of that that agreement. It, it certainly reads like it's been written by China and and just handed over to be signed by by Sogavare. Uh, you know, John, it's worth saying I've, I've been asked quite a few questions by journalists on this issue over the last week, and the question that they always lead with is to say, has, did Australia drop the ball uh, on on this matter? Um, and and you know, my my reaction to that is to say, well, I think I think that kind of misses a point that. What has happened here is that China has been caught red-handed trying to secretly negotiate an agreement to undermine the sovereignty of, of one of our neighbours. Um, and, you know, we, we in Australia and our, the Australian government cannot always know uh, what's happening in terms of secret discussions between people around, around the region. But this is an example of how China operates. And it is, you know, thoroughly underhand, thoroughly dishonest and entirely designed around giving advantage to Beijing at the cost of the countries that seek to do business with them. Um, uh, and I'm, I don't think that um, uh, Australia should necessarily feel that we have we have dropped the ball. Um, but it, it is clearly the case now that we're going to have to do more than we've been doing up until now in terms of our engagement in, in the Pacific. Uh, John, one of one of the things that we we constantly try to do in Australia is to sort of seek security on the cheap. Uh, you know, you know, we 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 don't want to spend money on it. We don't want to invest in the price of what regional leadership means. Uh, uh, if we are if we want the Pacific Island region to look to Australia as as the first provider of security for these countries. Um, so the sorts of things that I would like to see in relation to the Solomons is that we talk to them about. Would you be interested in seeing Australian Navy vessels home, home ported in Honiara? Um, how about if we work together to provide that type of security for the region? I, I would um, I would say to you, I think many Solomon Islanders, if not most, would actually rather see Australia there performing that function uh, than the People's Liberation Army. But of course, it comes with a cost. You know that that's not something we can deliver with a defence budget that's 2.1% of gross national product, we, we simply are going to have to be prepared to spend more if we want to provide that type of leadership to the region. Yeah, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I'll just make the point, though, that uh, somebody involved in government at the time we did go, we did mount an incredible operation there to secure the place. Uh, that's worth remembering. We have gone out on a limb to help the people of the Solomons in a big way, a very big way. Furthermore, uh, I don't say we've got everything right, but it's been a country that's been very dependent on aid. It's a very poor country, not in, you know, it has to be said in some ways because they've not managed their own affairs as well as they might have. Uh, and, and they have benefited enormously at the expense of the Australian taxpayer. But now having said that, let's come to the issue that you've raised. Uh, I, um, I deplore violence. I, as I said, I lived in the shadow of war. So People want to say, oh, you're being a warmonger, John Anderson. I am not. But the whole point of this conversation of everything I say and do and breathe on this is to say, wake up so yeah. we don't have conflict or minimise the chances yeah. of having conflict. Let's state that at the outset. Um, there's no other way to put it. I am staggered and amazed, and dismayed at the lack of urgency in the Australian population. Uh, I would have thought one of the biggest issues of all going into this election would be, look, Frankly, we've made too many mistakes. Peter Dutton has done a fantastic job of trying to turn around the legacy issues. I think he's been very good there. But whether you talk submarines, whether you talk frigates, whether you talk delays, whether you talk cost overruns, whether you talk simply the lack of acquisition prowess, it ain't a good story. It's very worrying. We've got to lift our game. But in a political context, in a democracy like ours, of course, you, you have to take the people with you. What more is required to ensure that it's not just 10 people, 10% of the population, the voting population, who think this is the issue? You know, you've said it yourself, the mid-20s. Mm. That could be the next term or the term yes. after that. And here we are, goodness, 
I don't like high fuel prices. I'm a farmer. We use a lot of fuel. I like driving. I do a lot of driving. But stop and think about the real implications of, say, being an African country, wondering about food starvation, food security because of what's happened in the Ukraine. Stop, stop and think about what will happen here when we're worried understandably about looking after the disadvantaged or people who are suffering in one way or another. If our basic freedoms are lost, our economy smashed, we're no longer in control of things. So these are big things. What do we have to do? Because you've been at the forefront of seeking to influence the national debate to get Australians to realise we may be toying with nothing less than our own future economic uh, and, and, and political freedom. It, to my way of thinking, it's all about honest conversations, John. Um, you know, I, I, in some ways, I feel I've been on a bit of a journey myself around this issue over the better part of a, de a decade now. Uh, you know, when I started talking publicly about the risks which I thought um, the People's Republic of China was going to present to Australia and to the region uh, in 2014 and 2015, frankly, people didn't want to know. Um, it, it was a, a sort of a nuisance that was getting in the way of uh, Australians being able to make a buck through developing closer economic relationships with, with the, the PRC. And, um, you know, slowly that um, uh, realisation, I think, grew that China was a country where we had long passed the point of um, re positive return through economic engagement and was increasingly getting to the area where what we were dealing with was um, heightened risk because of the growing authoritarian nature of the of the Chinese Communist Party. You know, now I think it's fair to say this is a bit of a, a sort of a commonplace uh, perception. Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, when I was starting to talk about this at about the time of the lease of the Port of Darwin, it was a deeply unpopular uh, perspective and, and no one was thanking me for, for, for doing that. Um, and that bled into how governments thought about these things as well. Um, I remember a senior person uh, inside the ministerial wing of parliament saying to me at one point, uh, you know, Peter, um, a day that we are not talking about China uh, using the C word is a day when we will be able to sell them more iron ore and coal. And, and it was the preservation of that sort of economic relationship, which was stultifying a serious consideration of the strategic problems that the country was facing. So how would I deal with it now? I, I think we need to have a prime minister and a defence minister and a foreign minister that are all prepared on a regular basis to take the Australian people into their confidence about the nature of the problems we're facing. And increasingly, we, we're getting that. I mean, I think that's just the product of the particularly dire situation that we're, 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 facing, we're facing right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, sufficiently long in the tooth now that I can remember a time uh, when we were able to use the forums of parliament much more effectively to actually have conversations with the Australian people about big strategic developments. You know, I remember the days, John, when prime ministers used to make uh, prime ministerial statements to the House or when ministers used to make ministerial statements. You know, these things hardly happen at all now in the in the parliamentary context. So um, that's that's the start is honest conversations. Just to elaborate a little, Peter, um, understand the importance of what you've been saying. Um, what it requires, though, of course, uh, because politics in a democracy like ours is largely a matter of responding to the squeaky wheel, and you've got to actually work very hard to switch people's attention from their immediate concerns. It's critically important we do so at the moment. And it just seems to me at the moment that we need an urgent national debate about who can best secure our safety in the future. And it's worth not only saying we need to examine the coalition's policies and who their defence people will be and what their prime minister's attitude would be should whoever wins. It's more than that. We know that the Greens are seeking to have a lot of influence in the next political realm, in the next regime in Canberra. And they've said the gold standard for defence is New Zealand's, which yeah. is spending 1% of GDP on defence and having almost no capability that I can really see, almost a peacekeeping force. So it's really important that we do everything we can to say to Australians, think carefully about who is going to be able to 
continue the trend, if you like, of alerting people of raising standards. Worth noting that 12 months ago, only a third of Australians thought we should have nuclear submarines. After, according to Compass Polling, after the Prime Minister announced AUKUS, it jumped to two thirds. It wasn't just increased awareness of the dangers, that might have been part of it. The real story was clear leadership explaining the issues and pointing the way to a solution. It galvanised yes. people. I, I think the Australian public is is ready for that conversation and, and in some respects instinctively knowing what, what needs to be done. I'm, I'm not surprised by that level of support for, for nuclear propulsion, um, even though for a long time, frankly, both sides of politics thought that this was untouchable uh, as, as, a, um, as a, real, a real policy outcome. Uh, you, you know, John, one, one sort of consideration that's worth thinking about here is that we hear the term bipartisanship being used in a lot in defence. And um, the thought sort of occurred to me recently that you can have too much bipartisanship because what what is really happening uh, with one side of politics is that the only thing they want to say about defence is that it's all bipartisan. And then let's just move on to have a conversation about something else. And it's kind of taking the issue out of some things that should be debated actually much more hotly. Like, for example, why do we have a problem in not being able to deliver real defence capability in anything less than about 10 or 15 year planning timeframes? And um, just to sort of uh, reflect on your comments about the, the Greens um, strategy and putting New Zealand forward as, as the model, um, frankly, that doesn't work for me. Um, I, I believe that New Zealand mistakenly took a strategic decision, um, you know, pr probably a decade or, or more ago, that it simply was not going to um, position itself in any way that could create problems uh, for its relationship with Beijing. Um, and so therefore, New Zealand has quite distinct from what has happened in Australia, New Zealand has been prepared to acquiesce to a whole um, range of Chinese bad behaviour, which we in Australia have found intolerable. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not a strategy that I think Australians would actually support um, uh, you know, were, were a government prepared to sort of articulate that as being a, a sensible Australian plan. Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, New Zealand looks to us, frankly, to uh, to really be the thing that secures it from instability in the Asian region. That's always been the case. The geography kind of explains why that happens. But Australia's position on defence is the thing that makes it possible for Wellington to, to say we will spend less than 1% of gross national product on defence. Um, so it's it's not a strategy that we could afford to um, import here. Uh, and I would think only a tiny number of Australians would really want us to go down that track. That That is uh, something that New Zealand can achieve only at the price of acquiescence to dominance from China. Yeah, I, I think there is a problem, uh, frankly, with how my, my old organisation, the Defence Department, is is progressing uh, at this at this very moment. And the way I would describe it, John, is to say that it's one thing to know you're in a crisis, um, but it's altogether different a different thing to know what you have to do to be able to respond to that crisis. Defence knows that Australia is facing a strategic crisis. They they've they have the intelligence reporting and analysis to lay out that story for them in, in exquisite and painful detail, and, and they understand that. Um, and you can you can read the sort of public version of that in the 2020 strategic update. Um, Defence has yet to work out how to break several decades worth of practices around how you design and buy defence equipment. That's still working in a kind of pre-2020 mode where you do think about equipment acquisition in five and 10 and 15 year increments. And I think the only way to deal with that situation is following the election. Whoever we have in power, their number one challenge must be to go to the Defence Department and say, hey, we are facing a five alarm crisis here. Don't talk to us about what you're going to be delivering in 2040 by way of defence equipment. Tell us what you can do in 24 months and 36 months 
to strengthen the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force as quickly as as you possibly can. And and in order to to arrive at that plan, we we are simply going to have to break every practice of how policy is made inside the defence organisation. And it will mean some fairly painful things, John, because in a lot of cases it will mean we're not building submarines in Adelaide. Uh, You know, we're not going through painful capability development and acquisition processes to take five years to identify a type of equipment that we could probably pick this afternoon if we if we really had to make a, a judgment about it. We will be relying on existing production lines coming out of the United States and in some cases Europe and, and the UK. And, you know, we will have to be thinking about uh, what we can do to strengthen our position, kind of like the Ukrainians are. You know, the Ukrainians are not engaging in 10 and 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 uh, 15 year force development processes. They're looking to get whatever they can get now to, to make themselves stronger. And um, that to me would be, I think, the central security challenge for our next government is, is to sort of um, um, r- ring the alarm bell and put to defence the challenge, which is to say, uh, what can you do in two years and three years that strengthens our position? And don't bother talking to me about what you can do in 15 years and and 20 years. Peter, thank you again for many years of good service. I know you're not going to give it up, uh, but also for, I think, help you, you know, unpacking what we should be thinking about in the context of the election, which must be called now in a matter of days. Thanks, John. Um, Whoever is Prime Minister, I hope they put a little sign on their desk with the saying, what would Vladimir Zelensky do? Um, um, Because I think he's... He's shown the capacity to bring forward depths to his character, which probably no one really expected before this crisis. And uh, I, I have a sense that whoever is our prime minister, that they're going to be dealing with some pretty serious crises um, over the next few years. But thanks, John. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Did you enjoy this episode? We cannot get good public policy out of a bad debate. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.